this weekly uh, updated figures we're now reporting some increases as I think last week we at least predicted and expected would happen on the basis of what we'd seen up to last Thursday. We now stand in a situation where the weekly ILI or influenza likelihood rate is 204 per 100,000 population, which is an increase from the corrected figure of last week of 109. I give you a figure of 120 has been slightly correct to 109 for the previous week. The advice remains the same uh, as it, it, it was last week. It is important for people, particularly in the actual risk groups, uh, to be vaccinated. And our hospital system is generally coping well in relation to this. It has the capacity to repair all the terms of infrastructure and plans to scale up that infrastructure to deal with what it is uh, dealing with. And our advice in terms of general measures for people either to prevent themselves from becoming infected in the first instance, or if they are infected, to minimise uh, the risks to themselves and to other people by staying at home and drinking fluids and so on, and only contacting the doctor in situations where they feel they are significantly unwell and, and doing so primarily by telephone, but still remains their advice and staying away as much as possible from hospitals unless referred or directed to go to a hospital by a medical practitioner. All indices of flu activity have risen over the past week and really flu activity is very high and may remain so for several weeks. Um, persons with flu-like illness attending their GP is now at 204 per 100,000 and this is the highest figure we have reported in 10 years of flu surveillance. We went above the baseline in week 50, that this is now four weeks later. It's risen in all age groups, particularly those in the 15 to 64 year age group. This is also matched by an increase in the number of um, calls to the FRI GP services where people say they have flu, and that's risen now to a high of 14.4% of all calls. Um, as Dr. Hulan said, the hospital admissions have increased, and the hospital admissions have been affecting all ages. The majority have been young adults and also young children. Um, we don't have detailed information on all the hospitalised cases. We focus the surveillance on cases in ICU. It is important to say that those hospitalised are mainly um, through a pandemic H1N1 2009 strain, and about 10% are flu B. Um, of the 72 ICU admissions, we have more detailed information on approximately 60, and in those um, where more detailed information is available, 42 remain in intensive care, that's about 70% are remaining in intensive care. Um, 71 of the 72 are H1M1 2009, and the other is a H3, which is a different type of flu A virus. Um, of those in intensive care, 37 are adults and 5 are children. Um, those sickest, in other words, those that we know are in ICU, are mainly adults in the age bracket uh, 45 to 64. And the majority of these patients have underlying conditions. Sadly, two deaths have been reported as flu-related deaths. Um, one is H1N1 2009 and one is due to flu B. Both of these deaths occurred in adults, and both of these adults had underlying conditions. As ever, the our way we're reacting to this is in three basic strands that I spoke to you about before. One is, as Tony mentioned, is the main message of going out to everybody is how to uh, prevent uh, getting the flu and also how to uh, look after themselves. And that's the same message as ever. If you start feeling ill, go home. Don't go out, don't be in contact with other people. If you are coughing, sneezing, do the catch it, bin it, clean it uh, message that we've been out very strongly about it all. And on top of that, as, as Tony said, we want people who have, who are in our risk group to get vaccinated. We have and are in the process over the next uh, week, 10 days, making sure that there is vaccine going into all the GP practices around the country who've been asking for it and for the others. So that's both a primarily the normal seasonal flu vaccine and also though we're also now sending out to all the GP practices supplies of last year's pandemic vaccine, the H1N1, which as you have heard is the main uh, virus affecting people in Ireland, so it will have a as well as part of that process. Finally, as, as you've been hearing, the one issue about this disease is generally mild for most people is unfortunately a very small proportion of people who get it who end up having very serious lung disease which needs to have intensive care support 
and they need to be ventilated. So as a consequence, the HSE is making very clear and sure that there will be increasing amounts of ICU care to meet the demand that may well rise, and that's been very clearly uh, dealt with in the last 24, 48 hours, and those messages have been very clearly to all the hospitals that there are no barriers to them being able to ventilate people, and they should do so, and not make any, have any difference about transferring people. So that's been very clearly done. That's going to be monitored on a daily, two daily basis over the next uh, three or four weeks, given what we see as being the main peak of what's going to be done. And it's very clear that that capacity will be made available within the system. Great. Thank you, Kevin. Now we're happy to take any questions we have. Just a question, Dr. Tony Hoodland. Um, these rates are in the near doubling of the figures from last uh, week, and they're the highest figures we've ever seen in relation to influenza since surveillance began in the year 2000. How bad could it get? And why are you confident that the hospital system can cope? Because we could possibly see a doubling over the next couple of weeks further. Well, first of all, um, we're not necessarily predicting, but we're expecting that we could see further increases in the rates based on the, what we know from the behaviour of previous winter epidemics for various forms of influenza and what we also understand of this particular virus that makes up the that's 80% of the, uh, of the pattern that we're seeing at the moment. So we're predicting on the basis of that that we may see uh, uh, a pattern of infection where we see increases for a five, six week period before we begin to see peaking and a tail off. In terms of the hospital system, uh, as Kevin has detailed, they have escalation policies in place, much of which were planned uh, and didn't in many cases have to be activated, in fact did not have to be activated, for example, in terms of uh, ICU beds during the course of the pandemic. But those plans remain in place and hospitals have the capacity on a hospital by hospital basis if necessary and if there is additional pressure that requires them for short periods of time while we get through this to commission extra beds, they have the ability to do that and they have the ability to make those decisions at a local level and they have the infrastructure and staff to, do, uh, to deal with that. Uh, there is no doubt with the increase that we have seen over the course of the last uh, week that there is added pressure on hospitals. Nurses, doctors and other medical staff in hospitals will be working harder and will be under more pressure. We know that with influenza like illness rates at this level that our general practitioners and their support staff are working hard and I think it's an opportunity for us to acknowledge that and pay tribute to that uh, and to the work that people are doing in that regard. But we, we, we believe that the hospitals in terms of their response capacity and their ability to be able to make uh, decisions to escalate and to prioritise where appropriate can cope both in terms of hospitalisation and uh, cross infection is a day to day, to day reality of the dealing with patients and health professionals are well aware of that. Um, and it, it represents one of the risks that attaches to, to going into hospital, as we know. The risks that attach to that in emergency departments are, in my view, enhanced in a situation where large numbers of patients are kept together. And that risk in terms of cross infection 